Okay, well, uh, good afternoon to those uh, joining us from the East Coast and good morning to everyone else uh, joining us uh, perhaps from the West Coast. Uh, we're grateful that you have decided to join us for today's NACO webinar. Uh, as we continue and resume our series on the pathway to recovery. Uh, my name is Kyle Klein. I serve as the program director uh, for the Cash Vest by 3 Plus 1 program at uh, NACO. And um, we're grateful to be joined today by our partners at 3 Plus 1, um, as well as the Shemung County uh, Controller, uh, Rajan Archambault. Archambo, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Um, really looking forward to um, their insights. And I think we have a really, uh, really have a, a treat for you today in terms of the topic. Uh, we're focusing on best practices and lessons that are learned in liquidity management, public funds and cash management during COVID-19. So what are some of those lessons that uh, our public finance um, uh, offices have learned? Uh, what, uh, you know, were some of the things that were unexpected and, and what are some of the things that, uh, that they did in terms of managing um, through that. And you'll hear really a great uh, testimonial and I think a case study from uh, Shimon County. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, get started. Uh, you know the drill uh, by now. Uh, if you have questions, uh, just submit those via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. I will be monitoring the, the chat as, as well as my colleague uh, here at NACO, and uh, we'll make sure that we get to all of those questions um, as, uh, as time permits. So um, again, very grateful for your time and attention, and uh, we look forward to sharing more about this program and uh, look forward to um, hopefully uh, taking your questions. So um, at this point, I will now turn it over to Alex DeRosa, from three plus one. Alex. Thank you so much, Kyle. And thank you to Kyle and Elena and everyone uh, at the NACO team for helping us bring this webinar to public entities and counties across the country. Our partnership with NACO has been an incredible experience every step of the way. And uh, our ability to just help public entities share information, share experiences and share stories is really what we're trying to achieve through this webinar series. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest for today, Rajan Archambault from Shimon County. Rajan, I think it'd be great if you could just quickly share a couple interesting facts about Shimon County we have listed on the slide here and tell us a little bit about your office and your position as controller of Shimon County, because many of the individuals on this call will be from all aspects of county government, not just finance offices, but legislative side and le legislative side and many other areas. So Rajan, please take it away. Thank you, Alex. Um, so Shimon County is located in New York, uh, upstate New York. So quite a ways away from the city. Um, so we're, we're quite small as far as the county goes. Uh, for New York, there's a lot larger, probably some smaller. Um, but outside of the city, we're probably average um, in size. Um, like we'll talk about a little bit later, we do have a decentralized process for payables, purchasing, processes like that, that do come to a head centralized for payment, issuing checks and things along those lines. So that's a little background of how our county, how it's set up, and uh, hopefully that'll help allow people to understand how we're kind of working on the back end. Thank you, Rajan. And I want to start the conversation today just by giving a brief overview of what topics we're going to go through. The overarching theme of this presentation and any content that you see from the 3 plus 1 and NACO team is going to be focused on data and how we can use that data to help in two main areas. The first area where we're gonna to start today is treasury services. That might be a phrase that you don't hear too often in your role, but in our world, when we hear treasury services, what we're thinking is your banking services. What, what um, services are your banking and your financial providers giving your office so that you can serve your taxpayers? We're also gonna talk about on the flip side, liquidity and cash flow. 
So truly what dollars are flowing through your banking products at your banking providers? And what data can we bring to the table on both of those matters, treasury services and liquidity to help your county prepare for the future and consistently maximize value on every dollar. So with that, our first topic is gonna to be focused on treasury services. And there's actually gonna be a quick poll question for everyone um, on, the, on the start of this slide that should pop up on your screen and allow us to take a quick look at how counties across the country view or evaluate their banking relationships. What you'll see on this slide in front of you is a brief example of some of the different items that can be quantifiable when you're looking at a banking relationship. That's something that we take very seriously at 3 Plus 1 because we know that your banks are your most important technological providers and financial providers. They are so integrated in everything that you do at a public entity, you, you certainly could not go on without them. So there are, are many items that are not going to be quantifiable when talking about evaluating a banking relationship. We know that there may be a bank across the street from you that's easy to access. We know that there might be a bank that you've worked with for decades that has just so much experience in your operations that it, that value that they can provide far outweighs something outside of that banking relationship. That being said, there are many things that are quantifiable. And that's what we strive to bring to the table when working with public entities is what can we look at from a data perspective and clearly show you what value is being provided from your bank. So the, the first thing to always keep in mind is what services are my banks providing me? We know that there are many types of banks that will issue analysis statements or billing statements each month that list out what services you use and what fees the bank may or may not charge based on those services. But there are also many banks that don't issue those analysis statements or billing statements, and they don't have very direct conversations with their clients about the services being used and any associated fees or required balances. So Ray John, I know you at Chemung County have a little bit of a different setup with uh, three or about three different banks. So uh, I was wondering if you could share Shemung's story about the different banks you work with and how you view the value of those banks with three plus one. It looks like you, you are on mute there, Rajan. I'm not sure if you're able to. No, oh, thank you, sorry. Oh, <laughs> no worries, um, thank you. So like Alex said, we have three banks that we primarily work with. One is uh, a local credit union. The other is a local uh, regular bank that we use primarily for investing um, our funds. And then the third would be a large uh, global bank that we use more for transaction processing. Um, and we use them because of the security and fraud measures that they have and the services they provide. Um, the other banks really cannot compete with. Um, and along with that, we have um, the analysis statements and we actually do incur fees for those um, services that we provide, um, which is one of the things that I think Alex is going to touch on a little bit later with what they were able to help us with understanding the analysis statements um, and how to best use that information and place our money uh, in the most, the best area to benefit the county, um, which results in earning or uh, incurring fees from that bank, but actually investing the money elsewhere with a better rate. Um, so it at the end, the net is a positive gain for the county. Thank you, Rajan. I want to hit on one point that I think you made that was very important there. You mentioned one bank typically used more for that investment purpose. And I think that's very common among public entities across the country. And that's exactly the conversation I wanted to start on this slide, where you have to keep in mind there are some banks that are going to be providing your entity with a great deal of services helping you issue checks, issue electronic payments, receive payments, and many fraud services like Rajon mentioned. But then you also might have banks that you honestly don't interact with very much. You may just have deposits sitting there for longer periods of time, either for investment purposes or just 
as reserve dollars. And, and it's important to remember that the bank that's providing you with a lot of services will probably request payment for those services or potentially pay you lower levels of interest for those services because you're actually using more resources from that bank compared to a bank where the funds are just kind of sitting there and you're not using many services, you should certainly be looking for that additional value from a relationship like that. So there's no easy way to compare banks on an apples to apples basis if you don't look at that servicing side and those analysis statements that Rajan mentioned. And Shimon County and Rajan's office is one of my favorite ones to work with exactly because of the example that he brought up regarding their willingness to pay banking fees at their main transaction at bank. Um, there are banks that will request a certain amount of deposits to be kept in order to not pay fees. And some entities will be so focused on reaching that level so they don't have to pay any fees, they forget about the flip side of the equation of, well, what if I just paid those fees, but then use those deposits to try to earn interest elsewhere? And that's exactly what Shimon County has been able to do over the past 12 to 15 months. They've been willing to pay fees because they knew that they were going to earn more interest to be able to pay those fees and still have some funds left over. So like Rajan mentioned, it was a net benefit. And that's a, a very clear example of how we try to use data to support maximizing value of cash across multiple banking relationships. Um, but the, the importance of knowing what banking providers are providing is going to extend beyond just that servicing side, also to the investing side, of course. And that's where the other type of data that three plus one regularly shares with public entities is peer benchmarks. What you'll see on this slide is just an example of six different banks throughout New York state where um, Shimon County operates. And what we do in this situation is send out rate requests to every bank in New York state that's allowable for public entities to work with to see where those benchmarks are. And this is an example of responses that we've gotten in the past 30 days from six different banks in New York State. And you can see if your entity is only working with, let's say banks four, five, and six, you might think that bank four is offering a great opportunity, but you don't even know about bank two or bank one that could help you increase value very significantly, more than double in the case of bank number one. Um, so uh, I know Rajan, your office has been using our, our peer benchmark data and helping increase the value on deposits for the banks that you all work with. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your experience over the past year, trying to use some data to help banks offer a little bit more from time to time. Yeah, even though we're, we aren't working with a large number of banks, we found that now that we're being more active in seeking rates and working um, kind of with the bank that's given us the best rate, we're getting more competitive rates now um, and, and similar rates across the board when we're uh, reaching out to the banks to get rates when CDs are coming to or we're looking to invest in uh, more money. So there, there is even benefit seen just within if you're using only one, two, three different banks um, because they know um, that, that we're going out seeking what the other rates are. So it's not that we, we're not aware of them where previously they kind of gave us a rate and it was, it kind of is what it is. We, we weren't uh, comparing them, kind of balancing them as much as we are now. Uh, so that, that initial rate request that we're getting is a lot more competitive than it used to be. I think that's a, a perfect point, Rajan, because it's not about some complicated conversation with a bank trying to negotiate a higher opportunity. It really can be as simple as, well, I'm aware that there are other opportunities out there, or even one of my other banks is offering a higher opportunity and engaging in that conversation with a banker so that they know that you are paying close attention to what those marketplace benchmarks are, and you are interested in trying to maximize them. And that's really where we've seen entities take their opportunities to the next level, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic because of the amount of cash that banks really have that right now over the past 12 months, we've seen such a drastic increase 
in deposits at all banks, that many of them have, have different appetites for cash and for different levels of cash. Dollars that may be sticking around in a bank for two to three weeks are very different than dollars that may be sticking around for one to two years. When we can share more information with those banks, it can allow them to provide higher yielding opportunities on that front. So that's just one example of where peer benchmarks are going to instantly elevate what your county is able to do. And you know, we see this all over the place and in many other areas as well. Um, whether I always think of when I'm shopping for flights online and I go to Google Flights and it sources prices from many different airlines all in one place, that's exactly what we try to bring, just some transparency to the marketplace. This portion of the presentation is gonna to transition to the liquidity data section uh, of where, where I was mentioning, uh, we're gonna be looking at the dollars and the cash that truly flow through the accounts of your public entity. And one quick reason why this should matter for every public entity across the country is related to your credit ratings. According to S&P, liquidity is now 10% of the framework for their local geo ratings. And we all know how much that can truly mean at the end of the day, having a strong entity for your county can result in millions of dollars in savings for your taxpayers. And really those credit rating agencies, what they're looking for is data and confidence. They wanna make sure that they can showcase investors that they are confident in the financial health of your entity. And that's a little bit of what the data that three plus one provides can do in this situation. So the next few slides are gonna be looking at a way to increase the visibility of liquidity data at your entity. To start, we need to make sure that everyone understands a little bit of differences between liquidity and cash flow. Liquidity is when we're looking at the true banking data, what's available to you all at your county today, whereas cash flow is what typically we would associate with accounting information or general ledger information. Um, an easy example is when an entity writes a check, according to your cash flow, those dollars are, are gone. They're out of sight, out of mind. But on the liquidity side, on that banking side, your bank still needs to collateralize those deposits until that check is cleared somewhere. And, and that could take a, a, any number of, of days to happen. So when we're looking at liquidity and cash flow, they're very similar but it's important that we accentuate those differences because that liquidity side, what is at the bank is what we can truly use to maximize value on cash. So Rajan, I thought it would be helpful if you could share how much data you typically see maybe before three plus one and after three plus one and whether that data was typically on the cash flow side or the liquidity side. Yeah, most of the information that we had previously was uh, limited and it was limited for the most part, because uh, we didn't really have a way to project out where cash flow would be using uh, any models other than just kind of past performance and reviewing uh, ledger activity and just kind of knowing timing of projects when invoices are going to come due, um, things along those lines. So with the projection information, it's helped out uh, immensely with liquidity um, in allowing us to kind of plan out six months to a year, two years with um, how much cash we actually have to have on hand and how much excess cash we uh, finally realized that we were kind of holding on to way more than we needed to. Um, so that allowed us to start investing a lot uh, more often and larger sums of money when we were investing. That's a perfect description of it. And you know, I, I have to imagine for you on your end, Rajan, did you get to see much banking data before three plus one beyond just logging into banking portals and seeing balances? Was there ever summarized or data that was truly analyzed uh, on the bank transaction side? Uh, not on the bank side. Most of it, other than looking at monthly bank statements, we weren't utilizing any annual activity or analyzing transaction flow from the bank side. It was solely once activity was booked and then looking at the ledger um, and kind of analyzing what happened previously um, in previous years. So we were always looking at past information. We didn't have really a good way to project out 
um, the ebbs and flows, I guess, of the year. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, then on the next slide, we're going to see an example of some very simple liquidity information that every county across the country could use today, right now. And that's just a, a simple analysis of looking at every single bank account that you have across your entity. Each month throughout the year, did your entity take in more cash than was received or than was spent out? Or did you spend out more cash than was taken in? Um, so in this example on the slide, you can see for this county each month, whether it was a, a positive month or a negative month. And at, at the highest level, in a very simple way, this is a, one way for you all to prepare for the seasonality of your cash flows and your liquidity position. Because when you're able to look at this on that banking side, you can really think about what months you will have excess cash, excess opportunity to maximize value, or excess opportunity to try to offset banking fees, maybe at one of your banks that requires deposits to offset those fees. What we're gonna see on the next slide takes it one step further. So what we see here is an example of stress test on an entity's cash. I like to use the phrase stress test because it always reminds me of architects, someone who would maybe build a bridge or an engineer that would help with the building of a bridge or a large building. And, and they do stress tests on that infrastructure to see what those um, structures can really hold up against in terms of a natural disaster or, a hurt or a, an earthquake. In, in this situation, what we're doing is stress testing your entity's cash to see what it can hold up against. And that produces what we call time horizon data. This information can provide you with two opportunities. One, it can tell you how secure your cash position is in the case of some wildly unexpected events maybe like the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and Rajan, I think this would be a great time to share your experiences at the county from maybe around March of last year, once that pandemic began and, and there were starting to be conversations about you know, sales tax revenues in New York State potentially being down as much as 30, 40, 50%. We, we were all very concerned and unsure where things were gonna go at that point, but Shimon County had a little bit of extra data at their fingertips. Yeah, so before we get there, kind of just the background of the chart, we've, we've been working with 3 plus 1 for about two years. So we have two years worth of data um, to get the five liquidity levels. I think when we first started, we only had one or two liquidity levels. So as the data, as they accumulate the data, they, they get more information um, based on seasonality, timing, and just general cash flow to uh, be able to project out using the different uh, levels. And from our standpoint, we kind of look at them as like confidence interval levels where um, the cushion or level one, we, we kind of know it's almost like working capital. We can invest short-term without much concern. Um, and then as we go farther down the line, um, I guess it would be kind of backwards. Level five, level four would be the, the more comfortable levels. Um, where you can invest on long term, um, you you just have the different different levels, which helps project out um, and become more comfortable with how much you're investing. When it, when we first started investing, it was almost uncomfortable because these CDs and CDRs that we were taking out were astronomically larger than what we were previously investing. So it took a couple months to get comfortable with how much we were investing. But I since we've started investing more and more on a monthly annual basis, we haven't, I would say, even came close to even the cushion area. It, 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 we only come close for maybe a week or two during the year when we have to pay the pension bill. Other than that, we still have a, a pretty comfortable cushion. Um, so when, when COVID first hit and there was a lot of uncertainty, um, we, we had a feeling we could kind of control our expenditures. We could reduce expenditures through um, budgeting um, just monitoring and cutting out some of the extra costs. What we didn't and we couldn't really project is how much revenue we were gonna lose or the timing of when we were gonna receive it. We had a feeling the state would hold payments longer so the, um, the timing of payments was gonna slow down, um, all impacting cash flow. If revenue was slower to come in, 
and we have the same amount of expenses, we're gonna drain some of our reserves. Um, but with, the, with this information, we kind of felt comfortable with where we were. So um, we probably had a step up over a lot of other entities, towns, villages, counties, um, just with this resource. Um, and then the other thing that it helped with was when COVID hit, we actually, um, instead of holding on to money, um, we invested more money while the rates where we're, the, we're at, um, I think they're, they're like a half percent right now. <laughs> they're not very high, but um, they were dropping quick. So we, we were able to jump on and take advantage of some of the interest rates before they, uh, they fell. And I, I think we did probably a six month to a one year CD um, just with having this information. It allowed us to do that comfortably in a time of uncertainty. I think that's a perfect case study. It's definitely wanted something I wanted to mention, Rajan, because you all did so well at the onset of that pandemic because of your ability to look at this data and confidently say, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, but still looking at levels three, four, and five, we know we're not going to need that cash in the next 12 months. We feel very confident. And it certainly at that point in time looked like interest rates were going to decrease um, so what the county did was take out a, a one-year CD at a rate that was significantly higher than what has been available over the past five to six months. And because that CD has a guaranteed rate, the county was able to earn that higher rate continuously. Um, we refer to that as protecting yourself from interest rate volatility. Rates will always move. We know they have for hundreds of years and they'll continue to do so. But when you can guarantee a rate into the future, you're securing value on your deposits. So we know every entity will always have liquid dollars that will be subject to that interest rate volatility. But when you're able to identify those dollars that are available for longer periods of time and are safe, that's where we wanna try to lock in that value so that you're not leaving all deposits up to that interest rate volatility risk. The next slide, is one of the few data points that 3 plus 1 provides where we're truly looking out into the future. I mean, if you think back to that stress test graph we just saw, we like to talk about those long-term dollars that are safe and able to lock value in on, but we also know there's going to be a, a large portion, if not a larger portion, of your dollars that simply won't have time horizons of one or two years available for investment. So what do we wanna do in that situation? We wanna look at forecasts of your liquidity position based on every single transaction that has come through every single account at your county over the past two years. And that's what you see on this graph. This is a sample of a short-term forecast that extends six months into the future. So while you may not be making one or two year investment decisions with this type of data, this is an example of where you can look at much shorter windows, maybe one month to two month or three month opportunities. And we even have some entities who take out weekly opportunities using this data because we can provide week by week breakdowns of where your liquidity position is likely to go based on your most updated information. And I mean, in Shimon County's case, I know that your liquidity position has changed drastically over the past two years. I mean, you all have um, significantly higher levels of deposits at Shimon County in the past eight to 12 months than you did in the 12 months prior related to a, a lot of work on capital projects that you all were reimbursed for. And, and what that means is you can't just follow the patterns from last year because you might be in a very different position. So Rajan, I thought it might be helpful if, if you could share if the county currently looks at other forecasts in other areas and how you might use this forecast going forward? Um, for the most part, we're just utilizing these uh, cash position forecasts. Uh, I know, I know, with COVID, we um, we generally do our borrowings at the end of the year, but we move that up um, to help with cash flow and uh, the the cash projections kind of assist with that. Just um, kind of being able to visualize in one cohesive chart all of the past activity with um, projections, you, you can kind of see the flow of things. It, it's a little easier to analyze than um, 
trying to create your own model. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's one thing that we're always trying to share at three plus one is this is your data. This is coming directly from your transaction activity at your county. And what we're able to do is leverage technology to bring that data to your fingertips so you can make your own decisions as quickly and as confidently as possible. And that's exactly what entities do when looking at this short-term cash position forecast. But it's important to remember that a forecast in its nature is never going to be perfect. We're always going to wanna to look back and compare um, an original forecast to what actually ended up happening. So one that our forecast can learn and improve, but then so that we at, at, at three plus one or at your county can share some information about why this year might be a little bit different than last year. And I think this is a very strong example for every person on this call right now, because you'll see for this entity, our forecast was in a similar position to what actually happened for this entity until around June of 2021, when something changed and this entity's liquidity position increased pretty quickly in a way that our forecast did not project. Well, I think if, if everyone can remember, in late May, early June, every public entity across the country started to receive their ARPA funding. And because that ARPA funding isn't something that happened in 2020 or 2019, obviously a forecast based on transaction activity would not point that out. So what a forecast in this situation was able to do is say, hey, we, we see a pretty significant difference at this point in time. Can you tell us some information that might have changed? And obviously that's an easy example with how big of, of, of a situation ARPA was for every public entity, but there are going to be plenty of specific examples that'll be unique to your entity where reviewing a forecast will provide the best results going forward because you can update a forecast and prepare for the future on what that's going to look like in a new environment. We know there are endless things that will make your entity different from any other entity out there. But when you review the data and hone in on those specific situations, it just enables everyone to have conversations and feel more comfortable with their investment decisions and the tools that you're using. On the next slide, we're gonna take a quick look at that stress test graph that Rajan was breaking down earlier, overlaid with a breakdown of the different types of tools that uh, this entity uses for liquidity management. So Rajan, I know you touched on this briefly uh, in the first stress test graph, but I thought it'd be great if you could share some of the tools that Shimon County uses, whether it be tools that lock in a rate for a longer period of time or, or tools that are completely liquid, but still offer competitive opportunities. Yeah, so like right now, currently, we have moved from CDs and CDRs to just maintaining those funds in ICS accounts because the interest rates are so similar. Um, they're, they're pretty competitive <clears throat> across the board. So what that does is it allows us to have um, more, more liquidity with those funds without really losing out on much interest. Um, where with the CDs, CDRs, we're locking money in for a set period of time. Um, you can pull the money out, but you are probably going to incur some penalties. Um, so with this information, we kind of see and compare the rates with the different types of uh, investments and options. And at, right now, it makes most sense for us to leave our money in ICS accounts, which uh, essentially would be a fully liquid account. And what you'll see on this graph here breaks down the liquidity tools that this entity is using into three main categories. I think every public entity should consistently think about when looking at their liquidity. One is a, a fixed income or a fixed rate type of tool. So what Rajan mentioned as those CDs or CDRs, something that will guarantee the same rate for as long as you take it out into the future. That's what you would see in purple on this graph. And if you think about it intuitively, it makes sense that those dollars locked in and in fixed income are at the bottom of the graph because those are the dollars that are least likely to be needed. They're the least likely to be accessed by this entity. When you move up the graph, you see that green region, which we label as high yield liquid. So high yield insinuates that it's gonna earn an investment grade rate. 
that's exactly what Shimung County is using with ICS accounts, like Rajan mentioned. These are dollars that are going to be able to earn an investment grade rate, beat those benchmarks that we talked about earlier in the presentation, but still offer liquidity, still allowing you to access those funds if they're needed. And that's clearly why you'll see those dollars will always be near the top of the graph because those are dollars that are most likely to be spent. The last category is low or no yield accounts, accounts that aren't quite offering a competitive interest rate, but are completely liquid and available, uh, keeping those funds available at all times. And in this entity's case, those dollars aren't earning interest because they're offsetting banking fees. And that takes us back to the beginning of this presentation, where we wanna focus on those two main sources of value. One being, of course, interest earnings, something we're all very familiar with, trying to earn interest on the money that you keep with the bank. But two, being offsetting banking fees. If your bank is requesting that you keep a certain amount on deposit, it's important that you have a direct comparison as how that earnings credit rate, which is the value they'll truly give you to offset your fees, compares to interest rates in the environment. Because exactly like Rayshawn mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Shimon County has been willing to pay banking fees at their bank because they're, they know that they're able to earn more in interest than that value they would get towards offsetting their fees. So they can use those interest earnings to pay fees and still net a positive. And that's why we can never look at treasury management and liquidity management completely separately. They'll always be intertwined because you need to know what services your banks are providing you and you need to know if they're requiring you to keep a certain level of deposit, um, or keep a certain level of deposits to fully offset your fees. Um, and that'll take us into the conclusion of the presentation. Just a, a quick summary of everything that we talked through today. Um, the importance of continually monitoring and benchmarking your bank fees, ensuring that your bank fees are competitive in the marketplace. You want to look at liquidity data across the board. Mostly, um, one reason that every entity should care about that, of course, is that credit rating. We know that credit rating agencies are going to be looking for more and more information from public entities, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, um, trying to showcase that your fiscal health is still very strong. And one great way to do that would be a, a stress test to show those credit rating, credit rating agencies that we've had independent third party stress test our cash and show us how long it should be available for into the future. Other items that are always gonna be important is in investigating that seasonality of your liquidity position. Like Rajan mentioned, trying to take advantage of those different points during the year when we're gonna have a little bit extra opportunity to look at those ICS or, or CD or, or other investment style accounts. Um, if you're maintaining the same level of investment consistently throughout the year, that likely means you're missing out on some opportunity that you might have certain periods of time where you have the ability to go above and beyond because of higher level of deposits. And when you're able to use forecasts to prepare for that information, you can have those decisions ready to go as soon as you enter those periods of time. And that's a significant difference than being very reactive and waiting until you see your deposits increase. Um, we always wanna promote being proactive and that's exactly what the data that we provide can help your county do. So with that, I, I wanna thank NACO again for giving us the opportunity to share Shimon County's story. I wanna thank Rajan very much for your, your input throughout this presentation. I'd love to open it up to, to any questions for me or for Rajan at Shimon County uh, on the Cash Fest program and this liquidity data that we share with public entities across the country. Great, thank you so much, Alex and uh, Rajan, for great presentation, very uh, helpful insights into uh, liquidity management in uh, during and, and, and after COVID-19. Really appreciate your presence here. Um, and I think, you know, I hope everyone on the call, you know, one theme that I continued to hear time and time again throughout the presentation is, uh, is the uh, the ability of leveraging this new technology, this this data, um, in a way to provide certainty, right? During uncertain times, I, I think if we all think about 
um, you know, how, how we felt, what we felt, and what that uncertainty was as COVID, you know, at the onset of COVID, um, you know, not really knowing, you know, what types of impacts uh, they would have on our public finances, on our revenue, um, and, and really what the future held, and, and maybe even um, not, you know, feelings of not uh, exactly knowing your liquidity positions. And, and what I'm hearing from Rajon and the, the case study from Shimon County is that um, that data and, and those insights, the, the benchmarking, the forecasting, that really provided that confidence that they needed to weather that storm and uh, to really have that confidence and, and, and you know, feelings of certainty. So that's, that's one, uh, one point. And I think, you know, in terms of the other opportunities that they've had um, to maximize the value on all cash, and that's really what this data does. It, it, it gives you the ability to, to help you answer the question, are we maximizing the value of, of every public dollar at any given time, no matter what the market is, is doing, the marketplace. Um, so having that certainty, and that comes from a third party data provider, right? And that's because of all of those factors and many more, that's why NACO has endorsed uh, this program as a national best practice. And uh, you heard the uh, success story out of Shimon County um, today. So thank you for sharing that, Rajon and, and Alex. Um, I don't see any questions in the, in the chat, but I do want to um, ask a question that, that is coming up. You know, um, Alex, you alluded to the fact that, you know, entities are receiving their ARPA funds or they've received their first installment. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the time horizon to spend those funds, it's, it's, it's quite lengthy thanks to um, a lot of the uh, uh, lobbying efforts by, or advocacy efforts by NACO to the US Treasury and to Congress. Um, you know, what, what would your message to those entities be that, uh, what, what would it be to those entities in terms of um, how they can apply this data to develop a plan for the ARPA funds? That's a great question, Kyle. I, I think when we touched on those two different types of data today, it's easy to, to right away say one piece of data that would be extremely helpful, of course, are those peer benchmarks. Knowing what value you can get on those ARPA dollars at your bank and at other banks in your state will help you maximize the value of those dollars. Because as you may know, any interest earnings that come from ARPA dollars are, are completely unrestricted and can be used um, for, for any county operations compared to the, the original ARPA dollars, which of course have to be used within those guidelines. But on the flip side, the other piece of data that we talked about today, that liquidity data based on your county's transaction history, we know that ARPA dollars won't be able to be predicted using that information because they're gonna be tied to your specific projects. So the first thing to always keep in mind is what value am I currently getting at my providers and how does that stack up in the marketplace? Then the second is what plans are there for those dollars? If you know you're not going to be using those dollars in the next six to eight months, you need to make sure you're looking at options with for every type of investment tool from one day out to six to eight months. And as Kyle mentioned, we know the actual time horizon or the actual amount of time you have to spend those dollars extends multiple years. So if you're at a county that has already said, look, we're gonna take our time, we're not gonna even maybe think about spending these monies until late 2022 or, or beyond, you have quite a few opportunities available to you um, in the marketplace. So it would be wise to collect data on those opportunities for both the short term and the long term. But ultimately, the decision's always going to be in your hands on how those dollars are spent. So that's going to be the most important piece when talking about maximizing that value. But great question, Kyle. I, I love how you brought up too, right before that, the fact that Ray John's examples of the fact that Shimon County increased their investment opportunity more than ever before during the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't think there are many entities out there that can say that. And that just speaks to the confidence that Rajan and his team have by looking at this data to confidently increase the value on that cash during a time when many entities were saying, we are pretty nervous, we're going to keep everything liquid and just focus on having enough cash to make ends meet. So I thought that was a really powerful point there. Yeah, the only other thing I'd like to add too is that I, I, I would say that we don't feel the need to have to use that money right away because of the projections and we can see out, we can, we can hold on to it a little bit better, make more uh, strategic decisions and kind of identify the best way to use them. Um, 
and that was probably another benefit. I just, I don't think that was touched on, but um, just having the confidence and knowing where our cash position is now and into the future um, kind of allowed us to take our time, not kind of uh, get the money and spend it before we needed to. Most definitely. A, a perfect example I can think of related to that, Rajan, is I'm sure many counties on this call are thinking about or maybe already have unrestricted those ARPA dollars through the revenue loss provision, in which case, if you're able to do that, then those dollars are not tied to any specific projects. They immediately become part of your traditional liquidity position. And that would certainly mean a significant shift in your traditional liquidity position. So when you can mm -hmm. incorporate that information into the stress tests and a forecast, instead of entering uncharted new territory, waiting to see what happens, you can already plan for what's going to happen based on your new updated position and old information. I think that's exactly what Chemung County is going to be planning to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rajan. That's very helpful. Yes, that, thank you both. And, and you know, one other, um, I guess, question in terms of, um, you know, that we sometimes get and in, in just as counties are trying to understand this solution and, and how it may be applied in their case, um, in terms of the ongoing value of this program, and it sounds like, Rajon, you've worked with 3 Plus 1 now for, um, for two years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the, the ongoing value, you know, I think 3 Plus 1 has something like a 99% retention rate. So, um, you know, this isn't a one and done, you, you know, solution or, uh, you know, a data and, and some recommendations that continues to add value each quarter. Um, it, could you talk a little bit, uh, speak a little bit to that, Rajan, in terms of the, you know, what, what you see each quarter and, and how, you know, you continue to fine tune to find opportunities? Yeah, so when we first started meeting, um, there was a lot of just discussion on kind of the county, how we do things, how we process things, um, projects, cash flow. Before we even started thinking about investing, we identified ways to maximize our, the, the benefit that we're getting from the bank. So we started by um, closing unnecessary accounts. Um, it sounds counterintuitive, but we switched a lot of our accounts from interest earning to non-interest earning, <clears throat> uh, non-interest bearing accounts, um, because there was a greater value in um, that we would receive. We would lower our banking fees. Um, and, and there's probably an indirect correlation there with also getting better investment rates because the bank already sees that we're doing our best on our end to um, lower the cost of our services to the bank. And I think there's been a, a, a good give and take there. Um, so once we closed out accounts, kind of consolidated some things, um, then we started looking at where can we invest? How can we invest? Um, and we're constantly having conversations quarterly on where we're at with um, certain projects. Um, we, we kind of set timelines for where we would like to kind of start, go, um, and kind of where we're gonna go forward. So we didn't just start working with three plus one and all of a sudden invest eight, $10 million at a time. It's been a kind of a, a, a working relationship over uh, probably a year or two to get to that point where um, the stress test results, the activity has kind of um, been accumulated. So the data is there. <clears throat> we're, we're constantly working on little things like that, just to kind of how can we keep moving forward? It's not just a, you know, we, we've got to the point where we're investing, we're comfortable. Um, we're just going to keep doing the same thing. We're constantly looking at um, what do we do, need to do next to kind of continue to maximize our benefit. Um, and I, I think one of the next things we're going to start working towards is um, what, what do we have to do to kind of update our investment policy and things like that to allow us to maximize maybe different uh, financial institutions, different investment types, um, things along those lines. So there, there's always something we're kind of looking at and working towards. I love how you mentioned not doing the same thing there, Rajan. And in your case at, at Chemung County, if you had continued doing the same thing as you were in 2019, there would have been a, just a lot of lost opportunity because you were in such a different position in 2020 and early 21 
than you were in 2019. So I'm, I'm sure having this continually updated data that showed you truly how much things had changed because there were periods of times where we were talking about you know, significant differences in a liquidity position from one month in 2021 compared to the same mm -hmm. month in early 2020. So it's really exciting to see those things change. But I know so many people are always focused on, well, I've always done things this way. So we'll be able to continue to do that, especially now with these ARPA dollars incorporated. I don't see us returning back to yet that liquidity position that your entity likely had in 19 and 20. So developing a new plan based on data is going to be the best strategy going forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's great, great uh, insights. Th thank you both uh, for, for sharing that. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to remind everyone that you um, will be receiving a copy of the presentation. Uh, and also uh, there will be a recording. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. So um, there is an option to uh, go back and watch that or share that with your colleagues. So just wanted to let you, let you know that, um, that we'll be in touch and that will be available. Um, I think at this point, uh, I'm just checking the chat function. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a message um, from my colleague, Alana Hurley, um, as you can see in the chat about the virtual events and other webinars coming up and, and also where you can uh, obtain that recording. So um, no other questions that I see. Any um, closing comments, Alex or Rajan, that you'd like to make? Just again, like to thank Rajan so much for, for joining us and for NACO for, for hosting this webinar. Um, if you can't tell, my, I'm most passionate about sharing data with public entities, and, and that's really our goal at 3 plus 1. Um, Rajan, I'm sure you can quickly speak to this. Every decision that has been made uh, throughout this process at Shimon County has been up to you and your treasurer there. Um, 3 plus 1 is, is really just focused on providing you with the tools to quickly and confidently make those decisions yourself. Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of lay out a plan and it's, they give us the tools and it's kind of up to the entity to take the information they provide and act upon it. Um, otherwise, there's no point in having it. You're not taking that information and utilizing it. Um, so just having that um, information has made a world of a difference in kind of our account structure, set up investments and kind of onward from there. Thank you. And again, I, like Kyle mentioned, I think that's one of the biggest benefits that we can provide being that independent third party that is truly just trying to provide that data that can showcase where value can be had. Yeah, absolutely. That's a differentiating factor and something that makes three plus one very special and, um, you know, a, a special program. And, and that's really why NACO, uh, again, just to reiterate that has considered and, and endorsed this as a best practice in liquidity management. So, um, you know, on behalf of myself and, and on behalf of NACO, I just wish to thank Rajon and Shimon County uh, for your partnership and for being here today um, and sharing your, um, yeah, sharing your insights and perspectives. And then Alex, thank you for uh, the presentation as well and your great partnership. And uh, again, just wanna thank everyone for uh, your time. Thank you for being on the call and joining us. Uh, we will be in touch. And um, I think the contact information is in the chat. Uh, function, but um, we encourage you to reach out if you have questions. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and, and share more uh, about how this uh, solution can be a value add to your county. So um, with that, thank you all very much and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.